Hello, everyone, and welcome to the long and winding railroad. My name is W.H. Park, and this is episode 29. As we uh, head down to the close of 2022, we, we're trying to get some, uh, you know, extra special guests to talk about all Japan of the 1990s with me here on the show at Post Wrestling. And and today we have a very special guest, uh, maybe our, our filthiest guest ever, and that would be a one Filthy Tom Waller. Tom, thank you so much for joining us here on the Long and Winding Railroad. Thank you so much. I have to wonder, who am I in competition with for being the filthiest guest? If it's not me, then who would it be? Well, we have we have a, a correspondent uh, by the name of Neil Flanagan that if, if he ever shows up on this show, he, he might be the filthiest guest ever. We'll see. <laughs> by appearance? No, no, no. No, by Psyche. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. All right. I'd like to meet this Neil Flanagan gentleman. Well, I'll tell you what, time. you ever come down to, uh, if you ever go to Ireland, that's where he lives. You can okay. uh, arrange to, to meet up with him. I mean, eventually I'm, I have to make it over there. I mean, that's where some of my ancestors are from. There you go. So there you go. So, so uh, I'm sure you can, you know, Neil, if you're listening, I know you're listening. He's a big fan of the show. He's going to, he's going to send you a DM about meeting up in Ireland whenever you here. Healthy Neil Flanagan. I like <laughs> anyway, that's kind of an inside joke. I, I maybe I shouldn't be breaking his confidence about this, but anyways, it's, it's all a joke, folks. But um, Tom's here. Tom, they, I, I got to say thank you for doing this because, I, as I understand, like maybe to put this in context, the, the day before you were in some kind of war of attrition with one Minoru Suzuki. Yeah, well, not. I mean, I could go back until Thursday night. Thursday night, I was in another war of attrition, a twelve man battle with uh myself and the west coast wrecking crew and bullet club jay white lp and juice robinson taking on the uh very this is like a fever dream tag team of yo okay yeah yo homicide uh eddie kingston uh kazuchika okada uh, John Moxley, and to me, the most amazing of them all, Amazing Red, also on that team. So that was Thursday night. Then Friday night, I had to face off against Homicide, Wheeler Yuta, Shota Umino, once again with the West Coast Wrecking Crew by my side. And then, as you alluded to last night, Defy Wrestling in Seattle, I had to fight Minoru Suzuki on the last night of this long and winding road of mine uh here so I, I made it though i made it out into the other side and uh i'll live to fight on i mean it, it sounds like you've been having a, a hell of a 2022 like you you, you went on your first uh, new japan tour in japan for the g1 climax and and i i got to you know i have to confess something to you tom like like i can't like you know, go continue with the show with, with you without telling you that um, in the battle between you and Zack Sabre Jr., you were debating the the merits of both Boy George and George Michael. I, I have to say that I am on team George Michael. I'm a big fan of his. Not, nothing against Boy George, but I, I have to say George Michael is Ichiban. I'm sorry. Well, which of the, one of them has a more recent hit? Uh, uh, which, one still, which one is still putting out music today? Well, that's really unfair. You know, like one is dead. So I mean, you know, I mean, to so me, I would, I would argue, like, who, so who's, who's the winner? Out, I, I would say George Michael still. He put out still anyone winner. who does, boy George is living. Yeah, but George Michael put out Faith and Listen Without Prejudice back to back. That's hell, hell of an accomplishment. Plus all the stuff he did with Wham. I mean, it's a boy, hell of an accomplishment. Boy George has had like a hit record in in the twenty teens. Look at that longevity. Culture club until that. I mean, come on. No, I I got nothing against. Hey, I think his cover of the Crying Game is a fantastic is a fantastic song. Twenty one more days until I get to show the world that Boy George is indeed Ichiban when it comes to the battle between himself and George Michael. Okay, I've not well, forgotten. I have not forgotten about that. I've not forgotten about Zach Saber Jr., the Celery Man, Zach Labor Jr. 
<laughs> Listen, I, as far as everything else goes, though, like I, I'm definitely on, on Team Filthy with uh, everything okay. else. So if, if it's against you and, and Zach C. Virginia, I, I get to I get to go with the uh, Team Filthy. But I uh, thought we're here to talk about all Japan in the 1990s, and I, I, yeah. I kind of want to get like uh, your background, like of your fandom of all Japan, and, and particularly of this era. Like when when did you discover AJPW? You know, this is uh, kind of interesting, but I would actually say I'm a bigger fan of All Japan. I'm like the one uh, who's a bigger fan of All Japan in the 2000s. Okay. Than I really am of the 90s. And I, I swear to you, I was having a conversation uh, with some of the New Japan staff, maybe the president of New Japan the other day, uh, and we were talking about this very subject. Um <clears throat> And I really, really enjoyed All Japan uh, after the All Japan and Noah split because there's something to me, obviously it was unpredictable, right? No one had any clue what was going to happen. No one had any idea how this was all going to pan out. You have, um, you know, people coming back. Tenru is banished from the promotion, right? Baba dies. He comes back to try to help save it. From its darkest depths, Kawada and Fuchi are the only ones left. You've got all these, you know, indie guys. Um, you got Grand Naniwa doing the crab walk out there in the All Japan ring. Uh, and then you have kind of uh, guys leaving the strong style side and moving over and, you know, kind of helping salvage uh what was still there and to me it's like a sign of resilience you know what i mean I, i'm sure everybody at that point was looking expecting all japan to fall and go by the wayside and while it may not be at its uh greatest heights uh of the past nowadays they still just celebrated their 50th anniversary show and I mean that is certainly nothing to scoff at. So um, I've I've been a uh, really an All Japan fan of them from their darkest times onward, okay. more so than the '90s. I mean, it's easy to be a fair weather fan, you know what I mean? When you're selling out Budokan left and right, it's easy to to cheer it on. But when you got you know seventy nine year old Fuji out there in the main event. In 2000, it's a it's a different story, but that that's my favorite uh, favorite era. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of that era too. Like, I I, I think like at that time, like maybe Taiokea was like one of my favorite wrestlers. Ah, uh, you know, you that. hold on, I've got a, I've got a Taiokea, a big Taiokea figure back there. Oh, like, is this something you got at, at Totokan during the summer? Oh uh, no, actually, it? this one I bought online. But uh, oh, okay, maybe, I could go grab it, but I don't know. Is that going to take up too much time? <laughs> it's up to you. It's up I'm to you. Start peeling about. figures off my. Uh, if you see it, if you can cr quickly grab yeah, it, sure. Right. So, and while while you're listening, like I, you know, like I, I have to imagine, like you know, you must have been like really rooting for George Hines to to get that eventual, you know, triple crown shot during that era when when he was like the top foreigner in, in all Japan. Well, honestly. Big fan of the uh, the golden left, Mike Barton. Oh yeah, he was, oh, yeah. He was doing good there. H yeah. How about how about Wolf Hawkfield? Oh yeah, <laughs> that is cool. Oh, I love I love Virtual Fighter, so of course I loved Wolf Hawkfield. There, there now, you go. I think this was like I mean nobody bought it for like a year. It was on sale, so they got it for a pretty good. It's year. criminal because like hey, listen, Taiokea, like the guy helped Mudo collect six belts. You know what I'm saying during you know, Mudo's resurgence after he came back with the bald head and stuff like that. And he joined all Japan for wrestling. So you got to give some, some respect to Taiki. And, and he had one of the best tag teams, in my opinion, with one uh, Jamal who would later become Umaga in the WWE. So, you know, it's a good, it's a good period, but then I would assume you went back in time and, and just watched some of the, the, the other matches from the, the decade prior. Yeah, of course. Um, like every, <laughs> Every wrestler is probably worth anything, any worth their salt nowadays. They've probably watched uh, Masawa, Kobashi, uh, Kawada, 
Masawa, Kawada, Kobashi, all the combinations, Akiyama in there. Um, if you really care about wrestling, you probably watch some Akira Tawe. So I've done all that. You okay. know what I mean? I've watched, unfortunately, I probably watched too many matches at this point to remember everything that I've watched. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a certainty. That's not even a question, but uh, my, I guess my favorites, you know, from this era are guys like Kawada. Uh, You know, I hate to say it, but I am a, a strong stylist at heart in a lot of ways. And uh, I enjoy the martial arts techniques. And of course, Kawada selling is just, like, I mean, it's off the charts. If you're if you're a fan of wrestling, if you're a fan of human emotion, I don't know how much better it gets than uh, watching Kawada in the ring. So I always, whenever I get a chance, <clears throat> I try to watch some Kawada, even if I have to beg to try to watch a Kawada match, uh, uh, you know. Well, interestingly enough, I, I will say on that point, like I think the only person during that, the same kind of time period that, is a is as good a seller or even better is one Shinjiro Otani because that man selling is just off the charts mm-hmm. as well up there with Kawada. But but interestingly enough, we you know like when we were discussing you coming onto the show, you know like I was asking you what what match you wanted to, and then I, I didn't hear back to you. Like you're a very busy person. So I suggested a, a, a Kawada match, uh, but you actually countered with like, oh, I was gonna talk about the match that we are actually going to talk about and and why don't you tell us the the match that you you actually picked yeah the match that i picked is from 1999 in uh yokohama it is the all japan junior heavyweight title bout between one yoshinari ogawa aka rat boy i don't call him that some do and one Masahiro Kakihara, formerly of the UWFI, a uh, shoot stylist. Yeah. I guess you could say a uh, martial artist, a mixed martial artist, a man that holds a mixed martial arts victory over Rocky Romero at Jungle Fight. One Masahiro Kakihara. That's right. So we're going to talk about for the uh, the All Japan, but actually, you know, officially it's called the PWF World Junior Heavyweight title. Uh, that For those that don't know, the Pacific Wrestling Federation was kind of the governing body, like the IWGP is for New Japan. The PWF was for uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling at the time. And we're going to talk about Yoshinari Ogao, who's the champion at the time, defending the title against the challenge of uh, newly joined to the company at this time, Masahiro Kakihara. I, I just noticed today... This is kind of off the topic, but related to what you were saying, New Japan had tweeted that uh, Mayu Iwatani had defended a stardom title at the um, Rumble on 44th Street show. And I don't know, is the SWA even a stardom title? Wasn't that brought over from... No, it, it was it was created by stardom. Oh, uh, okay. To like, some sort of, oh, maybe it's a high speed, the high speed belt. Is the high speed belt, I think, is also like I, I think might be, it might be might be that one. Yeah, uh, I'll have to look this up, but okay. <laughs> you are a big startup fan. I know that for, for a fact. Yeah, I love as, it. As I am, so I love it. I was a, I was uh very glad to meet Waka uh and Mina and Mayu over the course of the weekend. So but I, I think the dream is for you to get punched in the face by uh, Shiri. Is that, that is correct? <laughs> for me to get punched, I'm, I'm teaming with her. I don't want to get punched. It seems like everybody else's dream is either for me to get hit by Julia or really their dream is to get slapped by Julia is what it seems like more often than not. That's what that's the comments that I get. I'm envious of you because Julia is going to slap you. Wow. Are, are you looking forward to getting slapped by or punched by Julia? Because she's a pretty hard puncher. No, I want nothing to do with that. She's going to be trapped in a submission before she could ever hope to get to me. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm sure she hits harder than Zack Sabre Jr., but. I, it's it's possible. It yeah, is possible. They, possible. they they are very hard hitters all, all up and down the roster of, of stardom. But but back to the match uh, we are. We are Speaking of hard hitters, about. right? 
Yeah, speaking of hard hitters, Masahiro Kakiari, he's an interesting guy. So we'll talk about him first. So he started his career in the shoot-oriented shoot UWF Newborn, which would then kind of morph into UWF I, and he was apprenticed to kind of like the guy in UWF when Nobuhiko Takada. Uh, then he would work in the short-lived Kingdom promotion, where where he would like kind of be associated with, with Yoshihiro Takayama. And when Kingdom kind of folded, both Takayama and, and Kakihara jumped to All Japan, uh, kind of freshening things up because it wasn't, it wasn't really kind of Giant Baba's philosophy to bring in guys who didn't start off in the All Japan Dojo. Uh, he would ally himself with Takayama and one Gary Albright as the new version of the Triangle of Power. And then after that kind of folded, he would he would join Mitsuhara Masawa's Untouchables unit, which included uh, his opponent in this match, the, the kind of the second in the in the group, uh, Yoshinari Ogawa. Uh, he would leave for Pro Wrestling Noah in the Exodus of 2000, but would not stay for very long because he, apparently he had some like real life heat with Takao Mori. I think he lasted one match. I think he did the first show and then was back. Yeah. In Japan. And then he he went to, to went back to all Japan briefly as a freelancer, but then he would he would head over to to New Japan Pro Wrestling as a junior heavyweight in two thousand and one, and 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 stayed there. Really had a very prosperous career in that division until the end of his career in two thousand six due to uh, a, a spinal injury. Uh, so you know, really really great wrestler that had unfortunately you know had his career cut short by by an injury. But uh, were you a big fan of uh, Kakihara in in like in different phases of his career, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I've watched Kakihara from the UWFI uh, matches. I've watched Kingdom, believe it or not. Um, I've watched his fight with Rocky Romero, uh, and yeah, I, I loved his uh, his tag team uh, in All Japan with Nagai as they were the. Uh, the all Asia tag champs. And he was one of the few guys who kind of got uh, like, he got a bone during the UWFI and new Japan feud. That's right. Uh, you know, he was on some winning teams, which cannot be said uh, for a lot of the guys on the UWFI side. So uh, I myself am like a sucker for pro wrestling MMA fighters. Would you believe that? I, I find that it's hard to believe coming Who from, from you. Who would have thought it? But uh, myself, I was always like hoping. You know, you know, on boxing, there's always a saying like people are hoping for the great white hope. Like, is that what it is? I think so. Yeah, yeah, great white, yeah, something like that, right? Like, I'm hoping for the great pro wrestling hope. Like, which guy is was going to be the pro wrestler who's actually the toughest guy and who could go out there and win all these shoot fights? And I mean. Kakihara wasn't the guy, but when you watch him in the pro wrestling ring, he looks like he could be the guy. You know what I mean? Right. Um, a lot of the stuff that you that I I mean I saw in this match uh, holds up really well over time, which you can't always say about certain styles of wrestling or certain matches. But like Ka Kakihara's strikes are on point, you know, throughout the entire match. Um, you see head kicks, <laughs> you see, you know, uh, spots that wouldn't look out of place in any, you know, pro wrestling match today. And this was 23, 24 years ago, you know? So I think it just shows that like, if you, if you are so good at the simulated form of combat, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, super complicated stuff, as this match proves. You know, no, this is this is, I this is... Was, like, super effective in this match, and you know, I think you just transplant him, like I said, into today, and he would fit right in. Oh, definitely, definitely, he has a timeless. I, I, I do think when we get into talking about the match itself, it's, it's a really great blend of like that shoot style. Um, that he brings with kind of the more traditional, I and I would even go so far as to say with Yoshinari Gawa, a very kind of North American style yeah. wrestling that he brings because he he is not your typical all Japan like Kings Road wrestler. He's actually very much influenced 
by by North American wrestling with the kind of like because he was he he's called Rat Boy by a lot of fans because he would do things like eye pokes, <laughs> eye rakes, and, and things like that, and things kind of like you would see more in in American professional wrestling rather than in Japan, especially in, in all Japan. But you know, talk about Ogawa. He debuted for for all Japan in 1985. Uh, he he started what? off in there. Yeah, in 1985 he started. Still he, going today. Still going today. It's amazing, and he's right. he he works such a style that it doesn't matter like what how old yeah. he is because he he can still work the same style he worked in in the the eighties, the nineties, the two thousands in Noah, and he's and he's still like he's still going strong. It's it's like he's ageless as as a wrestler. Um, he would be paired up initially with Jinichiro Tenru in the Revolution Stable, along with Toshiaki Kawada and Samson Fuyuki and some other people as well. Uh, after Tenru leaves All Japan to, to start up his own company, he would become an important member of the All Japan Junior Heavyweight Division. At the time of this match uh, with Ogawa, this is his third reign as junior champion, having defeated Satoru Osako in a tournament. To, to win this title. Uh, Kakeyara is his first challenger in this reign, and he would have four more defenses before vacating the, the title in June of 2000. Uh, by the end of 1998, Ogawa will also become, and I think this is probably even more important for his career, he will become the regular tag team partner of Mitsuhara Masawa and win multiple world tag titles uh, with, with Masawa, have wars with the Holy Demon Army, have wars with the, with the burning... Uh, duo of Kenneth Kobashi and Jun Akiyama. He would also uh, go to, you know, in Noah, he would he he would be someone who who would win the GHC heavyweight title. Uh, I think as as a reward for his loyalty to to Misawa, uh, more than anything else. Um, and yeah, and that of course he does leave with ninety percent of the All Japan, you know, roster to go to form Pro Se Noah with with Mitsuhara Misawa. Yeah, I, I mean, he had that great match where he got beat up by Kobashi in the the title match uh, for the GHC title. Who who did he beat? Did he beat Taue for the he belt? Beat Tau- he beat Taue. No, I think. Oh God, this yeah. is embarrassing. Taue, uh, Taue beat Rikio, maybe. Taue beat Rikio, and then Taue, uh, yeah, lost to. I'm gonna have to look this up, but uh, yeah, what 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 are your initial thoughts of like Ogawa, like back then and like even to this day? I assume you still watch some of his matches now. Uh, you know what? Honestly, I haven't seen very much of recent Ogawa. I haven't seen very much of the uh, Noah Juniors uh, over the past few years. Uh, if I watch any Noah, it's usually you know the guys in like the main event scene or or the more shoot, shootier guys, Nakajima. Segura, the guys beating the crap out of each other. So uh, I'm kind of to say I'm behind wouldn't even be correct. I'm like completely in the dark as to uh, oh, the Noah Junior Junior yes. scene. So, large, so. so we we are both completely wrong. By the way, I'm looking okay. it up. He is the the third GHC heavyweight champion. He defeated Jun Akiyama. Okay, uh, so it's Masawa, then Akiyama, then Ogawa, Ogawa, and then Takiyama would win the title from him. So and then Kobashi. And uh no then Masao again and then it's Kobashi. Then Kobashi, then Rikio. Rikio, yeah. And then Tawe. Oh. And then to Akiyama. And then uh yeah, just a, a who's who then of wrestlers from that point. But yeah, so he he's had a very Noah his show's not called Noah in the two thousands. That's right. It's, it's, we're not. I'd have to research this part. We're just talking about Ogawa in in the 1990s. But but let's let's get to this match, and we'll talk as we go along. We'll talk about why you, why you picked it and stuff, maybe a bit more. But this 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 match comes from the uh, All Japan New Year Giant Series Tour. It's day 11 at the Yokohama Bunka Gymnasium. There is a recorded attendance of 6,200 people in, in this building for this show. And I, I kind of want to go through this card that this match is this match is on, Tom, with you. So in the opener, it's now Michi Marafuji and uh, Satoru Asako, and they defeat the team of Kentaro Shiga and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. 
uh, you know, Marafuji and Kanemaru still going to this day. Yeah. I, I, have you have you had a chance to tangle with Yoshinobu Kanemaru? No, no. But I, I did a lot of talking at him when he was at the announce booth during the G1. Uh, but I don't think he understood a word I was saying. You know, I was asking him for shots of whiskey. He just kind of, I mean, he looked at me like I had 18 heads. So I'm assuming he doesn't speak very good. I think he was just like, he was pretending not to understand you because that whiskey is only for him. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. That might he's have been. It. Oh, he's one of those guys. Okay, I understand. Uh, the next, guys. They got some interesting personality traits. It's, it's, it's it, I, I think anyone who likes whiskey as much as he does it, it has an interesting personality trait. Uh, six man tag team match Haruka Aigen, Masanobu Fuchi, and Siyoshi Kikuchi defeat Mitsuo Momoda, Rashi Kimura, and uh, young uh, Takeshi Morishima. That's a that's a, I'm what a I'm match! Not, what a match! More, this is like this is not even like prime Morishima who's like super huge, it's, it's probably like kind of still thin finish uh, Morishima because he was kind of like less bulky in, in his all Japan uh, rookie days. A uh, tag team match, the great giant Kimala and Yoshihiro Takeyama. That's a hell of a team. Uh, defeat Masao Inoue and Manua Kea Mossman, who would later become Tayo Kea. Yeah. Uh, six man tag team match. You must, you're going to love this team, Tom. Bart Gunn, Mike Barton, Johnny Ace, and Johnny Smith. Defeat cool. June Izumita, Takao Mori, and Taman Honda. Then we well, get hey, to- Taman Honda, huge fan. A huge fan of Tame and Honda. I got a Tame legit a, amateur Tame background. And Honda figure back there for oh my sure. god! Too. Oh my god! We well, we'll take your word for that. We don't. We maybe we won't uh, have to see it right now. I can show you all uh, all the Olympic rolling Olympic hells right now if you want. You want me to go? Hey, grab my kid? you know what? Do me a favor. If you could do me a personal favor, next time you're if you ever happen to be in the ring with with Jay White, you give him the rolling Olympic hell. Okay, which for one? Huh? There's like eleven of them. All of them. Do all 11 versions on, on Jay White just for me, Tom, please, okay. as, as I'm begging you here. Uh, following the World Junior Heavyweight title match, we have uh, a really interesting tag team match. Hiroshi Hase and June Akiyama taking on the team of Gary Albright and Wolf Hockfield. And our yeah. our, our semi-main is Akira Tawe and Toshiaki Kawada taking on the team of Jinsei Shinzaki and Mitsuhara Misawa. That's an interesting uh, pairing there. And our, our main event at this Yokohama show is Vader, is Vader, and he defeats Kenta Kobashi in 17 wow. minutes. So uh, it's a pretty pretty loaded card for, right. for an all-Japan non-Tokyo show or non-Osaka right. show. When you've got Wolf, uh, Wolf Hawkfield third from the top, that's when you know it's a stacked show. With Gary Albright, yeah. you know. I mean, it's a, you know, Gary Albright, Mr. You know, German Suplex himself there. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty. I got. If I can track down this whole card, I'm gonna try to see if I can watch it. <laughs> All right. So let, let's get into the match. It's for the the uh, the junior heavyweight title, and you know Kakihara is, gets introduced. There's a, you know some streamers for him. Yoshinari Gao is wearing a, a very nice looking satin ring jacket. And speaking of satin ring jackets, Tom, where where is that Rivera jacket? I saw a picture of you and Royce Isaacs uh, sporting. Upstairs, my other closet. I don't have time to go get it. Do, do, do you wear it? I have to ask you. No, it's it's honestly, uh, it's not like I don't think it's made for comfort. It's more made for style. Right. You know what I mean? I don't uh, necessarily yeah. live in the climate to be wearing jackets either. It's you know 120 degrees here in the summer. But uh, but you've made it as a pro wrestler, right? You've got a Rivera this is steakhouse jacket. Yeah, not only I mean. Okay, I got the Ribera jacket. I went to Mr. Danger and I got a towel. He gave me some trading cards. I got a t shirt. Uh, what other rites of passage are there? You need the- to go to Kawada's ramen restaurant and Tawei's steak yeah. restaurant now. These are got to be on your bucket list. I think. Yana, uh, Tawei's got a steak restaurant? Yeah, somewhere. Yana I, I, a bar. Huh? Yano has a bar. Yano. Yeah, that place is overrated, in my opinion. Oh. But don't tell me I said that, but yeah. I, I think you're better off going to Kotaro Suzuki's bar. That looks like a more fun place. Really? What yes. I, I, I I'd, have to find out, out. I'd have to find out, but uh, I'm sure it's. I'm sure you could get to Yano's bar. It seems very exclusive sometimes. Like 
not so many fans, so that's maybe a good thing for the wrestlers to go there. But but Suzuki, Katara Suzuki's got a bar. It's a small place. I, I think probably a little fun. And you know, you go to the you know pro wrestling DDT, you know, uh, owned uh, eateries that I think may or may not still exist these days. Who knows? I'm not sure if I can do that. <laughs> you might not be. Yeah, might be crossing uh, some some lines that uh, might not. Yeah, I mean, it's like it, it, it's a different world over there, as you know. Yes, uh, it's, it's not like over here. Like you, you can't you can't intermingle with the other species from the different companies, unless they have like some big Tokyo Dome show, and then then it's okay. yeah, yeah. Then it's okay. uh, but getting to the match right away, uh, Kakihara goes for some high kicks. Uh, conceivably, I think in order to get a quick knockout on on Nagawa here. Uh, fortunately for Ogawa, he's able to avoid them. Uh, Kakihara gets Ogawa in the corner and goes for another high kick, but Ogawa ducks. Kakihara gets caught up in the ropes, and then Ogawa strikes with a shot to the gut. And this is, to me, like straight out of like what I call like the, the Bret Hart style of wrestling that, that I think Ogawa must be a massive fan of because so much of his stuff reminds me of Bret Hart. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about Yoshinari Ogawa. Mm -hmm. well it's very basic he attacks like this I actually stole this spot this Kakihara spot and used it as a finish in a, a match recently that I had which was a UWFI rules match you know um, I needed a situation in which I was kind of winning and you know needed to lose quickly and I thought well what's a better you know, option than kind of what happened to Kaki here, Kakahara here. He throws uh, a left roundhouse kick. His leg goes over the top of the ropes and he gets like caught up in there. And then Ogawa uses that to his advantage. So it's like, you know, he helps keep Kakahara look strong here. It's not as if he beat up the better fighter with his strikes in Kakahara. He attacks with a jawbreaker. Um, and then it basically, I mean, it gets cut off, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. So there, there is like the, the jawbreaker, there's like some offense from, from Ogawa, but you know, it, it, you know, Kakahara's kicks are what, you know, like, you know, kind of turn the tide for him usually within, within the course of the match. Ogawa goes to the outside and Kakahara hits the ropes to do a tope, but Ogawa moves out of the way, but yeah, Kakahara smart enough, doesn't go through with the move. There's an exchange of kicks from Kakihara and moves from Ogawa, including an, an eye rake and a neck and a neck breaker to Kakihara, you know, kind of, you know, referencing these these kind of dirty tactics that he was kind of known for, which, which you know, gave him the nickname of Rat Boy. Even, I don't call him that either, by the way. Even the jawbreaker, it's not like a, uh, I mean, it's not like a cheating move, but it's certainly not like something that makes you look strong. You know what I mean? Uh, and he relies a lot on, on that jawbreaker as he does like early on here, as he does, uh, later on, you know, obviously much of his offense is based upon evading somebody and then capitalizing, which I think a lot of, uh, you know, everybody wants to look as far as like wrestlers go, I can tell you this. A lot of guys are very concerned with looking strong. Um, but there's a lot to be said for you know, looking not necessarily weak, uh, but Ogawa does look weak in some instances. You know what I mean? But then it, it pays off in the end because he's he's able to use that to his advantage because he's so cunning. You know what what's I mean? what's 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 the word they people say? Don't work harder, work smarter. And work I think smarter, that's yeah. And, but and that's what stood up. Like if he stood up to Kakahara this whole match and did this, you know, throughout his career and stood up to guys and and beat him up with strong offense his character wouldn't work. No. You know what I mean? It, it like his, the sum of his parts uh, is much better uh, than they are, you know, uh, individually. Well, well, contextually, he's also still basically a junior heavyweight still. So he has to work differently when he's wrestling guys who are, who are stronger and bigger than him. And this comes through with like his, his tactics and like that. He's a really excellent you know, at, at his core, a, a really great wrestler. Yeah, so, a, a like, solid, like, wrestler. And uh, you mentioned his quickness, but also one thing we have to mention is that Kakihara is used to being the quicker guy 
against a lot of the other uh, heavyweights in all Japan, right? So he's used to having a quickness advantage, and there's nothing nothing worse in uh, real fighting, I'll tell you that, than being ha- being used to having the quickness advantage and then facing somebody who uh, now has that advantage on you. It's something that's very tough to uh, make up for. And, you know, I think we see a little bit of that or a lot of a lot of that, honestly, throughout the match with Ogawa and Kakihara, where Ogawa finds himself in control because maybe for the first time in a long time, Kakihara is faced with somebody who's just quicker than he is. Yeah. So there's a point where Ogawa decides to work on the right arm of Kakihara, but uh, Kakihara is able to escape the control uh, by landing a solid kick to the butt of Ogawa, and then he follows this up with a drop kick. Uh, Kakehara tries to follow up with a spinning heel kick, but Ogawa wisely ducks out of the way. You talk, you're talking about this 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 quickness that you're, you're you're referring to, Tom. There is a strike exchange between the two, which Kakehara wins, and then he locks in a side headlock. Oga- Ogawa gets uh, uh, Kakehara up against the ropes, and as Ogawa backs away cleanly, Kakehara blasts him with this open hands and slap that knocks him down. And I, it was such a hell of a slap that I felt it watching it on YouTube here, Tom. Yeah. Some of these, uh, there's, there's a one that's particularly like brutal later on. Um, I will say sometimes the ones that seem like they're the worst aren't. So uh, I'm assuming that was the, the case when it came to Kakehara. But I mean, I, I um, you know, I was a big fan of this match because of Kakihara's offense. It was so basic, but everything just looked so, so crisp, so clean. His technique was so good. Every strike was in there. Um, and I just thought like, I mean, I was honestly, I was blown away. It's like, I watch this match. And I go, why haven't I been watching more of him, you know, for the past few years? So. I mean, you can. I maybe not as many people are aware of Kakihara. So, like, if you start, sure using, they're not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you start using his offense against them, they may not have an answer for you. Not that they have necessarily have an answer for you these days, but you may <laughs> maybe be more complicated for for your opponents in the future if you start busting out, you know, kind of Kakihara techniques uh, here. Ogawa. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I need to do more Ogawa offense. Since you know, you can, you can, you know, like if, if, you know, lines are being crossed, if they can be crossed, maybe you can team with him in the future. You know, he likes teaming up with like guys from, you know, outside of Japan. So yeah, I, I like consider myself the rat king in a lot of the rat king of wrestling. So that this is, this could be a new t-shirt you could put out there, Tom. Like, you know, we could be making you some money off of this show. Maybe Yeah, there's Uh, no, no double. (laughs) That one either. It's in reference to the Ninja Turtles rat king. There you go. Who's Splinter? No, there's a rat. The rat isn't there. The Rat King. Oh, uh, I don't know. I'll, the only rat I'm minions. aware of is there. Is there minions of like a army of rats in the sewer? You could be right. I only know about Splinter. They're, they're oh, the, yeah. the, the the turtle, the teacher, of, the teacher yeah. of the Ninja Turtles. But anyways. Uh, Kakiara blasts Ogawa with kicks to the chest while he's standing at ringside. And Ogawa's laying prone along the apron, and Kakehara delivers this really awesome-looking straight-down kick, like a scissors kick almost to Ogawa's back. An axe kick. Sorry, Andy, I stand correct. Andy Hoog-style axe kick to the back of the head as he draped him over the apron. There, great stuff here. Yes, Andy Hoog. Oh, I didn't. Think, I didn't think we'd ever get a reference to Andy Hoog on on this show. But the, that's just the, the benefit of having Tom Weller on the show. Everyone, pretty much out of all the things that Totacon has. They have Andy Hoog's gear, and that's got to be the the coolest thing. How much was it? Oh, God. Do you remember? I'd say twenty or thirty thousand American, maybe. Oh, Jesus. So. They just remember, they have like some people's gears, like, and I was just like looking at it last time I was in Totacon ago, two two years ago, and I was just like, who would buy this? But then I'm thinking, yeah, there's some weird, there's some people out there that might want to buy this person's gear. This I'm not gonna say whose gear, but. The 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 very shorts that Rocky Romero wore when Kakihara beat him at Jungle Fight are in Totacon. I saw them. So I don't know who's buying those. Yeah. Except for me. I mean, I'm in the market for them next time I go, especially now that the yen is even down more. There you go. Right? Exactly. Uh, I'm going to pick up those and <clears throat> Megumi Fuji Smack Girl gloves that 
I'm very upset I didn't grab when I was there last time, but yeah. You they know, have some but very listen, affordable stuff and then some insane stuff. So but it might be more affordable now because the yen is is, is so weak these these days. That's so. my shot. <clears throat> Excuse me, just uh coughing there off off uh, off mic. Uh <clears throat> as Ogawa recovers and tries to get back into the ring, Kakehara hits him with a vicious sliding sidekick to the head. I, I just love the it's the technique you're talking about. Like it's not a a drop kick or a sliding baseball kick. It's yeah. he, he runs along the ring and slides and then hits him with a side kick to the head. I'm just like, I have i don't recall seeing anyone else do that kind of a kick to the outside like Hakihara did here. I just, it's like a sliding like, ninja called. kick. Is that what it's called? <laughs> That's what I'd call it. It's what you're calling it? Yeah. There you go. Uh, Kakehara follows him to the floor, launches into him into the guard, launches him into the guardrail. Ogawa catches a kick and tries to smack Kakehara, but Kakehara has it scouted and smacks Ogawa and has him posted up against the steel post at ringside. And Kakehara goes for a high kick, but this is the turning point. Ogawa rolls out of the way, and Kakehara ends up kicking the unforgiving steel post. Mm. And uh, this is now the turning point for Yoshinari Ogawa and. Uh, Tom, have you ever have you ever done this where you've had an opponent lined up against a steel post on the outside and gone for like a strike and they moved and you ended up eating it? Whether it's from like you know like a, a, a punch, just something with your arm or with that with a kick? I'd say fifty uh, percent <laughs> of the time on house shows, every time, maybe <laughs> very very common spot. Uh, you see in wrestling. So, yeah, I've done this one. More, a lot of times it'll be a chop, you know, especially on like, uh, it's more of like a house show spot to me. You go outside with the person, you brawl a little bit, uh, you hit the guy so that they can hear it nice and loud. You chop each other so that they're going, oh, man, these guys are laying into each other. Um, and then you put the guy against the post, you swing for the chop. Oh, he moves, you make a big noise. You can go back inside and move on with your lives. Yeah, this is very I – lo I love this spot. If you got nothing else to do for about 10 seconds, you want to throw it. Just, just do this spot. Well, this, this – like I said, this is the uh, this is the turning point for Ogawa in this match because now he's going to go to work on this left leg, this left foot of, of Masi, uh, Masi Kakehara. <clears throat> and, again, this is the point of the match where I am convinced – Ogawa is a massive Bret Hart fan. The way he goes after the leg, the crispness of his moves reminds me so much of Bret Hart. Uh, this includes ramming the leg against the steel post several times. You know, there. You know, Kakihara tries to rally back with some kicks to the chest, but Ogawa catches the leg and hits this beautiful-looking dragon screw uh, leg whip. Uh, Ogawa drags uh, Kakihara to a corner and then plies a variation of their ring post figure four leg lock, which is something he, he, he did a lot, you know, post like after Brett would create this in the, the WWF Tom. Yeah. Yeah. He did a different variation where he had like the leg underneath and then he was stuck kind of using his foot to stomp uh, on the leg and like pry it back. Um, yeah. He was pretty, I mean, he attacked uh, kind of went to like the shoulder at first, but then was very, very focused on the leg. Uh, once Kakahara made that mistake and threw that kick. And, you know, obviously th that is something you see a lot of um, in Bret Hart matches, you know, working a body part. And a lot of times, I mean, you see it, you'll see it now. Um, you know, just there's so many matches now and everything's so accessible. Of course, you're going to see people working body parts, but it is uh, a little bit of a different contrast than the usual back and forth uh, pissing contest style uh that you would see around this time uh, ogawa goes for a, a heel hook but you know kakahara breaks up by grabbing his own heel hook which makes yep. uh, ogawa release uh, his move Ogo ogawa goes back to the leg with a figure four but kakahara right. gets to the ropes how genius the the shoot hold doesn't work on the shooter right every time ogawa tries to get the advantage with striking it doesn't pay off no he tries to shoot hold here. It doesn't pay off. Well, he goes to a professional wrestling hold, the figure four. And lo and behold, it works, right? Because Kakahara isn't as adept at the defense. Well, simple psychology there. 
but yeah, I, I think he's he's able to break this hole by getting to the rope. Yeah, he he breaks yeah. the like I said, he gets to the he breaks the hold by getting to the ropes. Classic pro wrestling move. Kakahara is finally able to create some space with with the Manhattan drop and some kicks to the chest, which knock uh, Ogawa to the mat. There's a another uh, scissor, uh, axe kick, I guess. It's, uh, I mistakenly call it scissor, an axe kick to the back of Ogawa's head. Scissor followed kick. By... The si- sorry part. Yeah, scissor okay. kick would be like uh, you know, like Booker T jumps and then does the. That would be yes. a scissor kick. It's a kick. Yeah. So this is it's, just a... the, it's just the up, down. Yeah. Yeah, that's so it. It's the axe kick, and then yep. he follows it up with this beautiful looking windmill suplex. Uh, Kakahara tries to go for a German, but Ogawa smartly kicks out the left knee with a back kick. Uh, Kakahara ducks an enziguri attempt and locks in a leg lick of, of some kind. Uh, uh, it's like where the opponent, his opponent is on his, his front, and then he grabs the leg and starts pushing it in with his shoulder. Like, what would what, what, do you have a name for this, Tom? <clears throat> It's um, the one that they use in Fire Pro all the time. I think is the name of it. That's a, <laughs> That's a fire, fire Pro. Fire Pro. It's like a, I don't even know. It's like a uh, calf, a calf hold or yeah. something. I'm trying to think of what they actually call it in Fire Pro because it's the only time I've ever seen somebody submit to that move. But the crowd went nuts. Yes, when put it on. I couldn't believe it. This There's- this move here. It's like a like in a um I guess the submission would be a calf slicer, right? If I was gonna have to pinpoint something, but this is not a uh much of a legitimate hold, uh, now that we've kind of developed the mixed martial arts. But much to his credit, he does switch to a knee bar uh pretty quickly, and the crowd goes even more crazy for this as Ogawa. Also goes crazy, tapping the mat almost yeah. immediately like nuts. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Oh, it's 1999. You still had to verbally submit back then, I guess. So, and my my brain is conditioned. Like when he did that, I'm like, oh, he gave up. No, yeah, like the yeah. guy, this is they don't do that at this point, and, and, and especially yeah. in an ultra fan for wrestling. For for those of you that don't remember, up until really it's the time of like Ken Shamrock coming to the WWF, I think that was the changeover to accepting the tap out as the legitimate form of submission before it was, you'd see guys in the eighties and nineties, just beating the crap out of the mat, tapping out with one hand, both hands and the match continues on. It wasn't like an accepted form of submission until, you know, the UFC got popular and then Ken Shamrock made his way over to the, to the WWF. So, and that's only been in the past, like, 25 years. That's, like, a new – this is a new development. This is, like, a new rule in pro wrestling. That's right, the tap. It, 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 so, basically, Ogawa is just slapping the mat in pain. Yeah, yeah. It, but now it would be like, oh, he tapped. It's it's a – it's a, it's you got to gotta give up. we got to end the match now. Uh, Ogawa is finally able to get to the ropes, but, you know, Kakehara follows up with a judo throw. And then – I think this is what you're talking about, the big – another yeah. big slap to the face. He goes for, for a kick. slap. He, hits, uh-huh. he comes off the ropes. He hits the ropes and comes off. Usually you hit the ropes and you come off with an elbow, a clothesline, a kick of some sort. No, he hit the ropes and he wound up and slapped Ogawa seemingly as hard as he could in the face. What a but, man. Yeah. What a guy. Kakihara or Ogawa? Yeah. You're taking, you're taking the slap. Both, uh, well, of he, he, both of them. So Kakihara goes for a pin. One, two. There's a kick out. Uh, Kakehara makes the belt around the waist gesture, and then he hits the cocky cutter, which is his version of the, the STO. And this is kind of his finisher, but o- Ogawa is able to kick out. And this is my theory, Tom, is that I think due to the due to the work that Ogawa did on his base leg, the left one, you know, had, and he weakened it to the point that Kakehara was not able to get the full power he needed to finish off Ogawa with, with his cocky cutter here. Yeah, yeah. And and possibly on that slap too. You know, I said seemingly all of his power, but with that left leg, that'd be the one that'd be planning on. He threw the right hand. So maybe I'd have to go back and look at the tape. Maybe his left leg was compromised. Maybe it buckled a little bit. Maybe he didn't have all the power on that slap. Good eye. Yes. He, he this Ogawa, he he scouted Kakihara. So he knew like I gotta work, I get a chance, work on that that base leg of 
Kakehara. There is a sleeper on Ogawa that turns a uh, uh, that Kakehara turns into a choke, but the ref quickly is like, "That's no, you can't do chokes in in an all Japan for wrestling." He breaks it up. Ogawa goes for his own sleeper, but Kakehara blasts him with this reverse kick to the face. Uh, Ogawa is able to hit an enziguri and follows up with a back suplex and then a second one, but Kakehara won't stay down for a three count. And I gotta say, if, if anyone in, in in all Japan at the time that you're gonna want to take a backdrop from or a back back driver suplex it's probably ogawa because it's probably the safest one <laughs> yeah probably and it, i mean it's his finish essentially um but he's still not trying to finish you trying to, he's not trying to end your life out there no no it's, it's trying to win the match to win an official wrestling contest with a three count and you know send you home and you can come back and wrestle the next day Ogawa tries for a Tiger Driver, but Kakehara blocks it and then goes for another Manhattan drop. But Ogawa uses the momentum for a roll up. It was a Northern. I think he was going for the Northern Lights. Was he? It looked like he was trying to go for another Manhattan drop. Could could have been the Northern Lights suplex, but Ogawa wisely, you know, reverses it, gets a roll up. There's a there's a two count here, and this is kind of like we're we're in what I call the crescendo crescendo of the match, Tom, because this is now it's just like oh my god, like pin attempts galore here. Ogawa blocks a strike and goes for a schoolboy two count. There's the this is one of my favorite moves. That, I don't know if you ever played Virtual Pro Wrestling yes. 2 for the well, Nintendo top. A lot of giant Graham. Yeah. More so. But it but if you play Ogawa or steal his moveset for yeah. like your creator wrestler, this is one of my favorites. He does the eye poke, chin buster, into the figure four jackknife pinning bridge, which I, I fucking love that move by the way can i just say like more people should steal the jackknife figure four jackknife pinning bridge because it's it's amazing but again this is only a two count but that would win the match if i used it in virtual pro wrestling too tom <laughs> there's a, a backdrop driver with the bridge but kakihara kicks out this crowd are like going nuts for this match by the way and it's, it's a testament because like they're you know all japan fans were not known for being that into the junior the junior heavyweight matches, but I think they they got just so absorbed into the story that Kakehara and Ogawa were telling here in the ring that they that they they were like responding so well to it. Yeah, when you think about like a junior heavyweight match, this is not what you would expect. This is not like a prototypical junior heavyweight match with high flying. Um, this is more obviously a more mat based offense and really you know built around like solid just the pro wrestling psychology of uh, working over the leg, which Kakihara in many ways needs uh, to win. He needs it to land most of his signature offense and Ogawa always having a counter for it uh, all the way up until the end. There is a great spot where Ogawa puts Kakihara on the top rope and, and Kakihara goes for, uh, I think, I think the announcer is called the Jukami, Juka Katami arm bar. Yeah. But and he gets it, but Ogawa grabs the pant leg of the referee and makes him fall on top of Kakehara, thus breaking the hold. And of course, like the, the fans kind of kind of boo this a little, but not fully. But the ref referee admonishes uh Ogawa for that, and you can and yeah, you can and then the crowd's like, Oh, we don't we want to see a clean fight here, and, and you kind of like made it a little dirty here, Ogawa. Yeah, he, he yanks like. He puts Kakihara up on the top, and he goes for a strike. He goes for, um, I think maybe uh, he goes for a punch, and Kakihara catches it and rolls off the top rope into the arm bar. Uh, has it extended, and like Ogawa doesn't wait very long. You know what I mean? The referee gets pretty close, and he grabs a hold of his pant legs and pulls him right on top. Uh, Kakihara breaks the hold. He's pretty pissed. He stands up and he's, you know, complaining to the ref rightfully so as he should be and ogawa ever the ever the opportunist ever the wrestling genius goes right back to the leg a simple stomp to the knee and then we're back off to the races that's right from here ogawa irish whips kakihara to the corner and runs in to drive his shoulder into his bread basket but kakihara moves out of the way grabs ogawa's arm and drops down for another arm bar but Ogawa uses the momentum to roll up Kakihara for a cradle pin and gets the one, two, and three. And and just 
I, I, I love this finish just because it came out of nowhere, but it made so much sense. Yeah, there's not a lot of finishes like nowadays where you're like, oh, that came out of nowhere. This one really comes out of nowhere. There was, like, it's very simple, uh, as you can imagine at this point, right? Ogawa eats the post. Uh, so you're expecting this is just kind of a normal spot that happens frequently. It never, almost never leads to a finish in a match. Um, Kakihara, like a smart wrestler, should leaps on the injury, but... You know, Ogawa's whole deal is that this guy is smart, he's cunning, he's wily, he is going to outsmart you. And in the end, he wasn't tougher than Kakihara. He couldn't match him blow for blow. He couldn't uh, go back and forth with him, submission for submission. His big holds, his backdrop suplex, which he hit, I believe, actually three times during this match didn't look like it was going to be anywhere close to keeping Kakihara down. So he had to rely on, uh, you know, trickery in a lot of ways. And while he didn't cheat necessarily to necessarily to win, he did sneak out the victory in a lot of ways with that roll up. And I like, I love this match. <laughs> uh, it was different than a lot of matches that, you know, people love today. Uh, but as we said, as I said earlier, like I think you could take this match and insert it onto any card in 2022, and it's going to get pretty much the same reaction. It holds up pretty damn well, if you ask me. It's, it, 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 it's a great match. It's, it's, it's under 25 minutes, which is a, a big plus for me. It's 16 yeah, minutes, 22 seconds. Okay. So and and it's it, it's a very brisk match. It, it flows really nicely, and 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 that's a, I think a really you know te a testament to the skill and, and the this, this style of, of Kakehara and Ogawa just keeping up the pace with one another to, to, to have like a very smooth and, and nicely flowing match that doesn't outwear you know outstay its welcome. Uh, I and I like this match a lot. Um, I don't I can't remember if I've ever seen it before because like I'm not someone who went out of their way to go watch too much junior heavyweight stuff. But like, I'm really glad you picked this time because like it, it was like, such a fun match for me to, to watch in, in uh, context with like a lot of the other matches that I've reviewed for this show. But uh, and yeah, like I, I, I'm a huge fan of Yoshinari Gao and have been for, for like, uh, you know, maybe for the last 10 years, because like I really turned around on him. I wasn't a huge fan of him before, but like now I go back and watch his stuff from, from the nineties or the two thousands. And it's just like, yeah, I appreciate more what he does now than I did at that time. So, yeah, you know, Kakahara bows to to Ogawa to show his respect for him, which is good as they'll soon be in the same, uh, you know, the same unit with Misawa called the Untouchables. And then, yeah, it's it's a it's a very fun match. And, uh, and it, yeah, I guess that wraps it up there. Any final thoughts on on the match itself, Tom? No, uh, you you said uh, you said you were going to ask earlier how I ended up. Uh, picking this. Yes. Uh, and I was trying to think of how I ended up picking this. But <clears throat> uh, there was a there's a wrestler, an independent wrestler, Wes Barkley, uh, who I'm friends with. And I have been imploring him to watch Ogawa matches for a couple of years. So I went and I was doing my own research and my own homework on uh, on cage match, looking up the highest rated of the Ogawa matches. And when I saw, well, there's one against Kakihara. Well, I could probably learn something from watching that one. I know, you know, that's not one that I had, uh, had seen, or if I had, I certainly hadn't remembered it, you know? So, uh, that's how, that's how I ended up on there. And there's a lot of stuff in there that I could see myself stealing, uh, good opening sequence, great finishing sequence. If you want to, you know, protect yourself, you know, loss on one of these indie shows around the country, you know, just saying that he shoot fighters out there. Uh, so really happy. I watched this match and uh, I'm going to be even more happy to go watch some more Kakihara. I'll probably watch uh, some more Ogawa as well, since uh, you can find more Ogawa stuff uh, than you can Kakihara. But well, I mean, I mean, you work for, for new Japan for wrestling for the most part these days, Tom, there's a lot of stuff on world with Kakihara as a junior heavyweight yep. in, in that, in that company in the, uh, in, you know, from like about two, in the two thousands. So I, I highly recommend a lot of stuff he does with Minoru Tanaka 
and and you know, like his alias of Heat as yeah. well, and like the stuff with Liger and, and other guys in the junior division at the time. Junior heavyweight six man tournament champion, I believe. I think he won best of the super juniors one year. He did, right? Who did he beat? He beat maybe beat. I think who, I'm trying to remember who he beat. Was it was it Minoru Tanaka? Or was it Koji Kanemoto? I, I'm yeah. I'm I didn't do my enough of my homework at this time. <laughs> I have that match somewhere on actual VHS tape somewhere. I'm sure in my house. But uh, Tom, anything to plug before we let you go here? No, not really. No. I mean, and uh, yeah, if we've gotten this far, uh, you know, you probably know where to find me uh, on Twitter at Filthy Tom Lawler. And uh, that's about it. You know, New Japan World. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, even though this is an all Japan <laughs> podcast, well, we, we cross all lines here. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to New Japan World, uh, please do so. Please watch my matches on New Japan Strong, my matches in Japan for new japan and uh check out historic crossover which is like the most exciting night of the past 40 years of my life we've got like great mood is last match in new japan is happening on the show now the first ever iwgp women's champion is going to be decided between Kyrie and mayu iwatani somehow the feud between Boy George and George Michael got inserted into Stardom's main event feud as uh, myself and Shuri take on Julia and Zack Sabre Jr. So um, I'm super excited about that night. Everybody else should be too. And I think it'll it. be fun. I, 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 I'm looking forward to that tech match. Like, and, and I know you, you, you deny it, but I, I can think, I think you're secretly hoping to get punched by or slapped by Julia. <laughs> As as a initiation into Japanese, you know, full full on, you know, getting hit by a Joshi wrestler is like, you know, you, the initiation one must have in, in to be fully part of the Perez scene, Tom. So, but uh, Tom, thank you so much for doing the show. I I hope uh, we can get you back on in the future. Maybe we'll we'll talk about the match that that I wanted to that I kind of like thought of choosing, which was by the way Hiroshi Hase versus Toshiaki Kawada. Maybe we can do that sometime in 2023 if you have the time. Yeah, and I told you I, I'm I'm up for any excuse to watch a Kawada match. Okay, so we'll we'll I'll save that for you, Hase versus Kawada, in in the future with Tom Waller back on the long and winding road. Road. Uh, I want to thank all the the listeners for for their support of the show. I want to thank Tom again for for appearing on the show after uh, having a war with Minoru Suzuki the day before. And yeah, you can find everything over at postwrestling.com. And uh, until next time, I will say. Goodbye.